All right. Thanks for joining in and, and, and listening to me today. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how I see the recovery process in baseball and, and how it relates to movement. Um, as with any of my presentations, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a good thing to put a little disclaimer up front just to say that this information is simply my, my current thought processes and, and knowledge, uh, or sorry, and theories based off of my, off of my knowledge base right now. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, this information is, is 100% correct or it's completely invalid. Uh, or it's not subject to evolve or change in the future. So, you know, there may be pieces of the puzzle that I'm missing and, and I've yet to discover or unravel or understand. And I think that's, you know, speaks to the the importance of looking at, you know, collecting information and understanding as, as a journey. So if I do have something, you know, missing, glaringly wrong, please let me know. And, uh, you know, it's it's an opportunity for me to understand and learn a little bit better. So if, if you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Steve Oster. I'm a chiropractor, strength conditioning coach, and co-owner of the Baseball Development Group which is a high-performance tr- baseball training facility in Toronto, Canada. Uh, prior to all this, I pitched at Cornell University, where I accumulated numerous accolades, including, uh, I believe, an eight-and-a-half career ERA, uh, graduating, I think, fourth all-time while pitches and selling similar in box. Don't worry, uh, I'm not going to be talking about pitching mechanics uh, or competing on the mound, uh, directly at least, uh, and, and we're going to get a little bit away from that and talk a little bit more about the recovery process. So, in April earlier this year, uh, I came out with a book on recovery as it relates to baseball, um, along with one of my co-authors, Tyler White. You know, it took me a couple years of researching, studying, clarifying, and, and condensing my own thoughts and ideas before I could finally get it out there. Uh, obviously, launching something uh, like a recovery guide uh, for baseball at the end of April may not be the best strategic move from a marketing standpoint, but I still think it's it uh, holds a lot of value and is applicable right now in, in, in December as we get into the off season. So my fascination, at least with the recovery process, started back in, I believe, 2015 uh, in a blog post that I wrote where I, I simply just posed the question, what are we trying to recover? You know, at the time when uh, you know I was thinking about the recovery process, I I couldn't really find a good answer for this, a rationale for for recovery in general in the baseball world. Um, you know, all I saw were you know a bunch of videos of people doing a lot of things and not really giving too much of a specific rationale or. or detailed, uh, you know, theoretical background on why we were doing these things. It eventually just started me down a path of, of, you know, curiosity where I researched and studied it and asked a lot of questions regarding to the recovery process and even looked outside of baseball. Um, But when we look inside of baseball itself, you know, I think we really see, you know, two ends of a spectrum. Uh, when it comes to, to, you know, applying and understanding recovery. On the one end of, of the spectrum, we have coaches and players and, and parents who aren't even really consciously aware of the value of recovering at all. You know, these are the, the people who are asking their prized arms at, you know, 13 and, and 14 to, to pitch multiple games a weekend just to win a $15 trophy that they could buy down the street. You know, maybe it's the athletes, uh, you know, the college athletes or the high school athletes who think that lifting at, you know, 5.30 a.m. Is, is, is a badge of honor and posting on Instagram with a hashtag grinding is, is a, you know, something to be to be proud of. Um, you know, even worse, there, there are some people in this camp who think that, uh, you know, just more work is, is always going to be better and breed a better outcome, uh, which is just not true. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, the idea has spread at least more recently that athletes just need to do way more recovery work. You know, if we're going to work out two hours in the gym, maybe we need to spend four hours doing recovery. Uh, You know, that has led to, you know, more foam rolling after lifts, more stim unit usage, more active recovery work, more mobility circuits, more sleep, more therapy, more supplementation. The list kind of goes on and on and on. Um, And to me, that argument falls apart a little bit when you, you try to consider, you know, what you're recovering from and, and, and understanding the adaptation process, which we're not necessarily going to get into to, uh, to detail today. Uh, but we should start off at least with, with uh, a definition. And this comes from Mujica's uh, Recovery for Sport textbook that is a fantastic resource. But they, he defined it as the time necessary for various physiological parameters, which were modified by exercise to return to resting values. Now, when you look at this, um, you know, the, the definition seems really straightforward and really intuitive, and, and I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, the problem is that things are just a little bit more complex than that, okay? And this becomes especially true when we go from, you know, just understanding uh, this, this 
scholastic definition to trying to practically apply it in a real world baseball environment where things are going all over the place sometimes. Um, and this is especially true when we talk about movement dynamics, which is even more complex. You know, ultimately, what we're trying to recover are, are certain biological disruptions, um, and and there are a number outlined here in this this uh, reproduction of of one of their charts. Um, where essentially, you know, we're looking at things like heart rate and, and blood lactate, for example, and we're trying to restore them back to previous levels. Okay, lactate is, is an interesting example, as we know, in the baseball world, uh, you know, because we've historically made pitchers do far too many things to try and remove lactic acid, which which isn't necessarily even a thing. It's it's actually called lactate, um, you know, as a means to just flush that that out because it's, it's waste and, and it needs to get out of there. Well, the funny thing is that that lactate is typically removed within about 60 to 90 minutes. Um, and, and if it's going to get removed anyways, uh, why are we so quick to, to try and flush it out? Um, this line of thinking, I think, is at least partly responsible for the explosion of stim units in recent years, which which has kind of confused me, and I've, I've written a little bit about that before. But, you know, if you look at the research on stim units, uh, you know, the evidence would more likely suggest that it doesn't provide an advantage over something that's free, like active recovery. Um, Maybe there's a potential benefit for a, from a psychological perception uh, of being and feeling recovered, uh, but the same can be said about a lot of different modalities, especially ones where you know players think are cool and and, and they're already uh, you know psychologically bought into it. So I think that that is one of those things where. You know, we need to just ask better questions and, and try to look into things a little bit more deeper and try to get a, a more theoretical rationale. I mean, one of the arguments posed for, for using stim units is, is it flushes metabolites out faster. But if we know that they're going to be, you know, out, uh, those metabolites are, one, a signal for adaptation, which we need in the off season potentially. But uh, two, they're going to be gone in a short period of time. Why do we need to rush to get them out? Um, anyways, uh, you don't necessarily, as a, as a coach or a player, you don't necessarily need to be measuring all these biomarkers of recovery, I don't think. Um, you know, we're not asking you to take blood samples of, of your players or, or muscle biopsies uh, at regular intervals if you're an amateur or collegiate and even sometimes pro athlete. Um, but, uh, a, you know, the underlying principles of your methods should at least align with, you know, returning these, these disruptions back to normal. Um, and I think in general... We do a pretty good job of that in, in certain uh, in certain realms and we aim with certain modalities like sl understanding sleep and understanding uh, you know the nutritional uh, you know requirements to return back to baseline and reducing the perception of fatigue and soreness a little bit you know and there are other modalities that we we kind of understand and we mostly agree upon but we still need to refine quite a bit you know icing is is one of those uh, examples where there's a movement now where uh, you know icing is the devil and no one should ever ice but you know, we know we know that it, it it slows down the recovery process and the healing process if if we do ice, um, and there are some potential negative uh, effects of it, but there are also some positive psychological and analgesic effects of using ice as well. So I don't think we need to necessarily throw it completely out. You know, we need to potentially ask better questions about, you know, what is the optimal dose for active recovery? We know that athletes respond well, uh, you know, to doing some light work. Uh, when they're in a fatigued state or, or the day after, but how much do we need to do? Um, and, and what are the signals for adaptation? These are just some questions that I think we're all, uh, you know, kind of on the same page, but we need to just refine a little bit. You know, there are modalities and, and other things that we like to throw at athletes from a recovery standpoint that I don't think we necessarily fully understand or we may be misapplying altogether. A proprioception is, it, to me, is a very good example of that, it, it, you know, and if we look around the baseball world and, and ask players for a post-throwing routine, a lot of people will be throwing in exercises and, and interventions that are supposedly improving or restoring, sorry, proprioception. Um, you know, we believe that we, we must do something to restore that when, in fact, if we just let fatigue uh, subside because that is probably more likely what's what's causing a reduction in proprioception from throwing is the accumulation of, of acute fatigue. If we let that acute fatigue kind of subside, um, we will see a return to normal proprioception. So we don't necessarily need to force that with exercise, you know, with the caveat of that being uh, that maybe it's not necessarily, uh, you know, a, a restoration of, of proprioception, but it, it can be used as 
you know, pushing an adaptation. But if you look at the research on, on trying to improve bird reception, it's kind of iffy anyways. So, um, you know, why are we doing all these things after throwing if, if we don't necessarily think they're going to have uh, an effect on returning to, to uh, previous resting levels of proprioception, which we know they won't, um, and we aren't necessarily too sure that it's going to have a training effect. So, you know, there, there are um, things like that, and manual therapy is another good example where I think a lot of people think that we can fix soft soft uh, tissue and we're fixing things with our hands or with lacrosse balls when reality it's just a temporary uh, a very temporary effect so there are things that we we need to do a better job of trying to refine and understand but what's the most confusing to me with, when we talk about recovery and modalities and intervention is you know we we never really see all that much information or people stressing the returning to baseline of range of motion um, and not just can not just uh, passive range of motion like in the picture, but active and strong uh, and and controllable range of motion. And I I always under um, try to understand uh, the mindset. And I and and I think this is what this presentation is mostly about here. So you know it, it it's been encouraging over the last few years at least to see you know more of an emphasis on the baseball world on on understanding and and trying to implement a constraints led model to movement and same thing can be said about complexity theory and understanding motor control and it seems like we're pushing the needle a little bit further uh, towards understanding this this incredibly complex and, and mysterious thing that is human behavior um, you know we we've come to appreciate that there are certain constraints on on the movement system you know the boundaries or limitations that you know are dependent on the task and the environment and the organism and that's going to help shape how we move um, you know, when we're trying to solve a particular movement task, you know, that solution is going to be dependent on the current dynamic of, of all of these constraints, you know, as well as our prior history of movement. You know, and here's my hypothesis. Uh, you know, if we're asking a pitcher to solve one of the hardest movement tasks in all sports, which I think it is, um, then wouldn't we want to play closer attention to the nature of their organismic constraints? You know, that is, if we're asking Max Scherzer to solve the task of executing a pitch, um, 3,500 times per year, you know, we'd want him to be well equipped to do so. Um, we'd want to ensure high motor intelligence or robustness in solving the task itself. And we'd probably want to ensure relatively stable control parameters or constraints, you know, or otherwise the same starting conditions if we're going to ask him to do it that many times. Um, but in my opinion, I think the lens uh, that we're using to, to attempt to understand these two problems, uh, the robustness and, and these starting parameters, is a little bit foggy. Uh, when we talk about movement, at least in my opinion, we're attempting to solve the most complex thing on the planet. Um, I think you can make a pretty good case for that. But there are a near infinite number of elements and, and levels and interactions and, and sub-levels and sub-elements and you know, influences and, and all these different interactions and integrations between these things, um, you know, to reliably predict outcomes or, or control the system as a whole. Okay. Um, if we look at, at Clayton Kershaw, for example, here, you know, we could, we could view him, uh, and how he interacts with his environment from the macro level as its own little system. I mean, we could zoom in into his shoulder and look at how, you know, muscular tissue interacts with connective tissues. And, um, you know, that could be its own little system. And we could zoom even, even further into the, you know, the extracellular matrix and, you know, how proteins between cells like integrins and dystrophins kind of interact with each other even more and, and, how their their own system. I mean, there's there's so many different layers and levels and, and integrations of, of these own pieces of the puzzle that um, it's just remarkably complex. And I think when it comes to you know framing movement and, and potentially influence, influencing it, um, you know, we're often imposing a complex lens or imposing sorry a complex lens to a, a complex problem, which to me may be an issue and. You know, for example, uh, you know, claiming a pitcher is is moving the way that he is on the mound uh, because how the of how they're moving at maybe forty percent intensity in another drill um, is probably more of an argument of faith than it is fact or theory. Um, you know, we see stuff like this all the time where you know you hear your coach nowadays at least say, you know, this player this player can't keep his legs straight uh, in an active straight leg raise on my table. So you know what? He's not ready. Uh, he's not ready to hip hinge. Uh, in his swing. Um, 
and and to me that's a pretty big jump it's it's connecting a lot of dots and and that's not to say necessarily that um that that those things cannot be true uh to me it, it's more of an argument that trying to solve complexity with more complexity is is not the best path to do so um you know and and in my opinion and from what i understand from some uh, some authors who are uh, systems thinkers one of the best ways to actually solve complexity and interact with a complex system and and try to solve for it is to break it down into simpler components um, and attempt to understand the relationships between them um, and and that means necessarily that we don't have control of an outcome Okay, we, we can't look at a complex system and say, if we do this, this is necessarily what's going to happen. We have to let go of that control. Okay, so when we talk about, uh, you know, the simplest component of movement uh, that we can at least measure and intervene, you know, one of the things that I look at is, is the joint, uh, specifically the, the joint capsule itself. So the joint and the joint capsule are important, you know, first and foremost, because it's a decent proxy for, for movement capacity. Uh, you know, in other words, it really helps coaches and players ask, uh, answer the question, can your joints do what you're asking them to do? Okay, if we look at this example of Aroldis Chapman and we look at his, his drive leg or his left leg and, and look at how much his femur internally rotates relative to his pelvis or look at how much his knee rotates relative to to his uh, the backside of his belt initially, which it does a lot without the belt moving, that's just a display of your know, femur rotating internally on the acetabulum or the pelvis. If I put someone on the table and they do not display that, um, can we reasonably expect them to uh, have that sort of movement on the mound? Um, you know, this idea is, is something that I've talked about quite a bit, but it's essentially, you know, trying to prevent coaches from banging their head against the wall, uh, you know, in drill work, trying to, you know, out cue a physical limitation. You know, we need to have, I think, a better understanding of what the athlete can do from a movement capacity standpoint uh, before asking them to do it. Um, and, and, I, and I think this is a good place to start be, uh, with the joint. You know, another reason that the, the joint is uh, important as well, it's a, it's a tremendous source of sensory information to, you know, help the brain understand what's available, uh, what's cap what is capable of its boundaries for movement, you know, pressure information, uh, movement information, and, um, and some of that actually directly connects straight to, to, to the brain, okay? So that's an important thing because it's, it's directly connecting, doesn't have to go through the spinal cord in certain instances. Um, and if you've paid at least any attention to range of motion research in baseball, you probably know that it's really confusing. Um, you know, over the last few decades, there, there have been a number of different study, studies that have shown, you know, a wide range of, of findings and conclusions regarding performance and injury. And uh, I think this is a bit misleading. So, you know, we've, we've seen stuff like internal rotation deficit and GERD, uh, is definitely going to cause injury. And now that's taken back to, okay, maybe it's total range of motion. Maybe actually internal range, internal rotation increases with throwing. Maybe it's shoulder flexion. Maybe none of this happens at all. Um, and I think if we're going just off of what the papers say, uh, we we are probably not looking at it correctly. Um, you know, there in theory, there's there's a lot of variables included in performance and injury um, and range of motion changes happen way more frequently than, you know, in spring training and then reassessing at the end of the year, or even, you know, four months later. Um, so I think this is important to understand and maybe something that we need to reframe. My goal, uh, you know, specifically in season is, is just to maintain a normal bandwidth of movement capacity. So I don't want to gain too much range of motion and I don't want to lose too much range of motion. We want to keep things somewhat stable and, and, and try to avoid, uh, you know, a, a too big of a, of a range or too big of a jump because that can lead to a, a massive nonlinear shift in overall movement behavior. So this is kind of speaking a little bit to uh, maintaining those constraints and maintaining those, those uh, starting conditions for, for our skill and for our movement. So if we spend our entire offseason, for example, working on trying to automate at least uh, a, a specific pattern of movement like throwing, you know, wouldn't we want to just keep that going during the year? Um, we, we know the joint range of motion is, is the simplest means of identifying movement capacity or one of the simplest means. And that movement capacity is a constraint for, for movement as a whole. 
So ideally, we want to keep an eye on this. It just makes intuitive sense. Uh, to go a bit de deeper, uh, you know, our movement patterns are significantly dictated by our movement history, uh, which is really an ongoing, dynamic, and evolving process. You know, we know that the more we practice a movement with similar constraints, the stronger that pattern will be. Um, this is what's called deepening an attractor state. You know, moreover, if we spend a significant amount of time going through a movement pattern that is stable, uh, the tissues involved will be stressed very similarly and, and therefore uh, have a higher tissue resiliency uh, for that specific pattern. You know, if you think about going from years of back squatting and your body building up resilience to it to all of a sudden front squatting for, for a couple of weeks, uh, you can imagine how sore you're going to be after those first few lifts. Um, you know, even though the movement is, is very similar, the specificity of loading is not really quite the same. So let's put this together with uh, a common scenario. You know, a pitcher begins the offseason, for example, addressing, you know, the movement or joint limitations incurred from a long season of baseball. You know, they spend their time restoring normal for them glenohumeral elbow and hip arthrokinematics or, or passive range of motion. Uh, you know, they restore, uh, you know, the, the, those qualities. And then for the rest of the offseason, they just make sure that they're maintaining uh, that controllable range while gaining strength and hypertrophy in the gym and, and then, you know, trying to place that all together uh, on the mound for how, the, how efficient they're moving and how well they're moving. You know, as the season progresses, uh, you know, the pitcher maintains the strength and power uh, because that's what we do in baseball, and they put much less of an emphasis on maintaining controllable and strong range of motion. So, you know, this is a very common scenario in baseball where, uh, from a strength conditioning standpoint, we... You know, we check in way more with make sure you're getting your in-season lifts and you're, you're, you're lifting uh, to be strong in season, you're maintaining power. But, you know, how often are we trying to maintain strength and range of motion? Um, and, and in this example, you know, it seems like, you know, mechanical changes are holding up for now. And um, unknowingly at the beginning of the year, maybe they, they begin to lose small amounts of shoulder internal rotation or elbow supination or lead leg internal uh, rotation and that stability uh, of the movement pattern is, is just being tested and challenged by these altered constraints until one day, you know, a small change in, in one of these ranges turns into a, a, a big change in overall movement outcome and they start moving differently. You know, as the task becomes more and more frequent um, and the variability of which that pitcher can solve the task is, is diminished or, or lowered, the same areas keep getting loaded and loaded and loaded. You know, the robustness of the system itself is diminished um, and therefore variability in how we solve the problem decreases. So new areas of the body are now seeing acute spikes in stress and demand. You know, they're seeing too much uh, or, or too quickly uh, of a load relative to what they're used to. A few weeks go by and with this uh, increased soreness comes uh, potentially more load. And, and then one day it just becomes too much to bear and the pitcher goes on the DL. So what can we do about it? Uh, yeah, well, the answer to this question is is obviously not uh, not having a, a coach hire a full time therapist or ATC to break out a goniometer daily. We need a, a, an alternative. We can't do that in most cases. We're just constrained by that. Okay, so. What do we need to do? My opinion, uh, one of the best ways to solve that is is to use controlled articular rotations or CARs uh, from the functional range systems group. What's a CAR uh, or what is CARs? CARs are essentially active rotational movements at the outer ranges of motion. Okay, so it's taking a singular joint uh, or in the case of the spine, multiple joints and trying to actively move them at the outer ranges um, in a rotational manner. We use them for a number of different reasons. Uh, one of the biggest ones is to assess organismic constraints, and that's the topic of <clears throat> this this lecture a little bit. But um, we also use them to, you know, essentially maintain joint and capsule health. So every time you go through an active, full uh, full range movement, you know, we're potentially squeezing in more nutrient into the joint. Uh, you know, we're lighting up the brain and, and the motor cortex and the sensory cortex about having that range of motion. And, uh, you know, we're potentially also helping direct tissue healing and, um, you know, getting the body to align uh, collagen fibers uh, the way that we'd want them to. Uh, you know, finally, we use it uh, as a training tool and in, in integrating, you know, some of the cars into our actual training to, to improve our awareness and, uh, you know, just improve overall options for movement when we do train so when do we perform these these cars um you know in the words of of dr spina you do them every damn day uh you know for 
five to 10 minutes, I don't think there's a better bang for your buck from, you know, a self assessment standpoint, um, or also an intervention standpoint from a mobility perspective. Okay. Um, you know, those five to 10 minutes in a warm up, uh, as we like to do them in a warm up, they give our athletes an opportunity to check in with, with how they're doing and how their joints are handling the training load. They give us as coaches valuable information. Um, you know, as, as an athlete can come to us and, and point to a specific range for a specific joint and say, Hey, this is tight or this is sore. What do I do now? Rather than them just trying to get through, you know, go through the normal warm up, start throwing a baseball and all of a sudden come to you and be like, Oh, my shoulder hurts a little bit. You know, it gives us good information. So we do them every single day when athletes are in here and we encourage them to do it every single day when they get up to just get their joints moving. Okay. Um, so what, what do they look like? So we're going to go through a video of, you know, a different, a number of different positions, uh, for cars, for our hips, as well as how we would train, uh, to get more range. And then what we would do after the fact. Okay. So you're going to see me here performing controlled articular rotations for my hip in a number of different positions. Again, the key component here, uh, is to isolate movement to the one hip, trying to get as much range as we can possibly get with rotation. So for the hip, you know, there's a number of different ways that we can do this. When we have athletes come in and first learn the system, we expose them to a number of different ways to, to go through cars and we let them choose uh, the one that they feel the most confident in, in that they can actually perform the protocol and not display changes on a day-to-day -day perspective. So if they feel uh, hip cars, maybe in a half kneeling position, that's the one that they're going to do consistently and, and it'll keep them honest. Uh, we specifically, we prefer using a pole because it constrains the rest of our body. But again, we're using this you know, as an indicator of how we're doing day-to-day. Once we've identified, uh, you know, a specific range of motion that is, is uh, may potentially in deficit relative to than it was the day before or something that we may be wanting to improve in the off season, we have to apply some sort of protocol to improve that range. Uh, one of our main uh, go-tos for that is, again, from the functional range systems world of pails and rails, we're essentially trying to uh, contract into that stretch or into that end range with isometric uh, contractions. So... Uh, essentially we're trying to find that range of motion where we're stuck or we're stiff or we can't get any further. And then we're going to try to impose uh, a contraction into an immovable object, which is the pails, and then try to actively pull ourselves further into that range with the rails. So again, you can see there's a number of different positions in which I can try and, uh, you know, isolate a specific range. There, there's no set protocols. It's, it's not, you know, this is how you stretch this muscle. It's really all about finding the range that is in deficit or stiff and then com uh, contracting into that range to gain more range of motion. Now, once we have that range or we've improved it, we need to start using it. So these are just a few examples of how we would actually use that range of motion um, as some ways in which we'll try to express not just an isometric and working at that end range, but we'll try and take that joint through a full range. So you can see me here uh, just going through some basic movements. So you can see how hard this is for me, but we're trying to just isolate range uh, is specifically in, in rotation, um, external rotation, internal rotation, a little bit of flexion in these various positions where I'm trying to actively work into that range and get out of it. I'm not just passively hanging out. So there's a number, again, a number of different ways in which we can, we can do this. We can isolate specific joints first, which is the way that we like to do it. And then once we specifically isolated that joint, uh, we, we can actually integrate that with other joints. Um, but again, it's, it's all about being creative. And, you know, if you go to our Instagram page, uh, or our YouTube channel, there's a bunch of videos in which you can see more of this stuff if you're interested. But, um, yeah, again, it's, it's, it's very specific specific to, you know, what that player is feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, do this, do this, uh, stretch for this muscle because everyone's a little bit different and they're going to feel tension and, and they're going to feel changes at different ranges and we need to attack those specific ranges. Okay. So in summary, I mean, I think the, the big takeaway from this hopefully is that we should start thinking about recovering range of motion, um, and, and trying to, you know, measure it and, and improve it and address it on a day-to-day -day basis, especially when we're imposing a lot of demand on our athletes in the form of playing baseball. Okay. What we're trying to do, uh, you know, is, is prevent changes, uh, large changes in organismic constraints, uh, 
uh, so that we don't, you know, ultimately change our movement pattern and maintain the same sort of throwing load, overall load, uh, while, while, you know, potentially undergoing an acute change or an acute spike in specific load into our tissues. Okay. Um, to me, joint recovery and, and, uh, looking at joint range of motion really is the central to individualization process. If you want specificity and you want individualization, I don't think you can look any further or any closer uh, than just looking at the joint itself. So, um, you know, I think that's that's a really important concept as, as well to keep in mind. Uh, you know, for us, using cars and using this process is a way of, uh, you know, improving autonomy and self-discovery for the athlete. Uh, you know, I think the more you look into the research and the, and, and the more you try to understand, uh, you know, what we're trying to recover in the, in the perceptual subjective side of things. Uh, one of the best ways to do that is to allow an athlete, you know, some sort of autonomy and some sort of, you know, their own direction in, in how they want to feel recovered. Uh, and for us, the self-discovery process of, of using cars early on is, is a very good way and a very powerful way of doing that. Okay. Um, Again, I don't need to necessarily harp on uh, the daily assessment thing, but to me, it's it's very underrated. Uh, you know, once you've you've taught this well and you have your athletes perform it well, they become their own coaches in a way, and, and they become their own movement coaches, and they have a way of you know distinguishing pain versus stiffness, and 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 have some sort of a methodology and, and protocol for addressing that, where you don't have to necessarily check in all the time. Uh, you know, even even as a coach. Uh, as a therapist or a strength conditioning coach, you want to have more information and better information from your athletes. So if they're if you're getting them to perform these cars as, as a daily assessment tool, they can come to you with way better information uh, and, and they can help you direct wherever they need to go a lot faster. OK. Um, and finally, I think if you if you try to centralize and, and integrate these findings into an actually comprehensive system and an integrative system, uh, you know, between the coaches and the athletes and, you know, the strength conditioning coaches and the therapists, you're going to be way better off. Uh, if everyone's speaking the same language on this front and they all have, you know, access to this sort of information, it can be a lot easier to address and make changes, uh, you know, especially in season. So thank you again for listening. Um, if you do have any questions or, you know, any comments or you think I'm missing something, you know, let me know. Uh, you can find all my contact information here. You know, if you're interested in, in purchasing the Recovery for Baseball book, uh, you know, just head to our website and you'll find it pretty easily there as well. So thanks again for listening and uh, have a good day.